Uh, James Bedner is going to give us a lecture on Param for anyone who ever want to do declarative programming and uh, show us the way. Thank you. All right. Well, that should be everyone, in my opinion. Um, first off, um, how many people are aware of the traits package? How many people actually use the traits package in your own work? Hmm. All right. Well, I'll try to convince you. Um, this is yet another uh, GitHub project, uh, and uh, I am James Bednar, the uh, first author, Chris Ball, couldn't be here today. Uh, there are also a number of other uh, contributors, including one that might be uh, familiar to people from in thought. Um, anyway, we'll get back to that later. Uh, so most of us are here, presumably, because we believe that um, Python is good for doing science, and it's certainly true that flexible polymorphism and dynamic typing Make it simple to write code that solves your problem, whatever your problem might be that day. However, I would also argue that Python is bad for science uh, because for exactly the same reason. Um, if you write some piece of code and you give it to a student or a collaborator, they can pass whatever they want into your code and you have no idea what's gonna happen, they have no idea what's gonna happen. Um, particularly if you have a deep processing pipeline where you pass it to one object and nothing actually happens to it, but it goes on to another and to another and finally something happens to it, People have no idea what type of data ought to be given or what requirements there are for that data. And uh, say Python will happily um, square a string, uh, raise it to a power, do, do ridiculous things. Um, and so it'll pass through lots of stages in the pipeline until it finally gets to some error that's really hard to figure out. And so the result of that can be um, difficult to use, difficult to maintain, code that has errors. And I think that this really, um, slows down scientific progress, and it leads to some pretty serious, uh, scary bugs. And obviously, you can't blame Python for this, but if you think about the Mars Climate Orbiter disaster, that comes down to exactly the type of problem that I worry about, where one part of, of code, or even one part of your organization, makes certain assumptions, but those aren't made explicit, and other parts of the code doesn't follow those assumptions, leading to the crash of that probe in this case. So, in response to those problems, what people typically do, uh, what very careful, good-minded uh, Python programmers do, is they write a lot of documentation and they write a lot of assert statements saying that um, this is what I assume about the inputs, this is what you should supply, and so on. And so that helps users figure out what to supply and um, it helps reject um, when they um, supply something inappropriate. But this is a lot of work. And because it's a lot of work, it's almost never done completely. It's, it's almost never up to date. It's not never properly um, bulletproofing your code so that you can actually detect when you're getting the wrong things. And the final result of all of this is you just end up with a larger pile of code and you were already having trouble maintaining it. And now you have even more trouble maintaining it because you've got a big pile of assertions. You have a big pile of doc strings that don't necessarily match what the code actually does. Things have just gotten worse. Um, and not to pick on any particular piece of code, but I have, this is uh, code that I just grabbed from a website from someone working in my area, which is computational neuroscience, but uh, there are actually a, a lot of fields that have something called a connector, so you don't even have to care what it does. Um, I'll just show you what, what the standard thing to do is. Um, standard thing is you create some Python object, in this case called a connector. It needs some arguments of some sort, some sort of parameters that control what it does, and so, um, you list those, you give them some default values usually, and then you need to store them somewhere. So far so good, except there's no documentation. I have no idea, even though I'm, uh, I've worked in this area for decades now, I, I don't know what these people might have meant by space. What is space? I don't know. Um, but that's, the reason I don't know is that it's not documented there. It's documented in a subclass. Fine, so I, I look at the subclass and I see quite good documentation. People have actually um, enumerated what is supplied to this, to this code. It accepts these parameters, and here's some description of them. And it actually does some checking. Uh, it checks that this parameter is a Boolean. Now here it doesn't check that space is a space object. So if you pass something else, it won't know it. Um, but that's all well and good. What if we look at another subclass? Here's another subclass. Both, these are both subclasses of connector next to each other in the file. Now what does 
this other subclass have. It has an almost identical set of, of doc string, and it differs only in, because it added one parameter, and so you need another copy of all, all the same information in the doc string. Now these happen to match right now, um, but they, over time, when one of them is modified, they won't match anymore. If you look at the um, default values of these, of these um, uh, attributes or function arguments, they happen to match now. Again, if one of them changes, you won't change the other. Uh, this actually adds um, uh, an, another assert. It asserts that it's greater than zero, but if you look at the, um, at the definition, it says the float between zero and one. It doesn't check that it's less than one, and that's because it's really hard. It's really hard to write down all the ways that things could possibly go wrong. So um, what should you do about this? If you actually care about writing some code that you want to give to your student or you want to give to your collaborator and you want it to work, you don't want there to be some mysterious error you find about later that in fact something was truncated, it was meant to be a float, it's being treated as an integer, something horrible is happening. Um, what should you do? Well, uh, obviously people don't agree because they've heard of traits and don't use traits. <laughs> But um, I would argue that the solution is declarative programming. Um, and the idea behind this is instead of trying to fight Python's flexibility, instead of trying to patch it at every moment, try to, to stop this stuff from getting in, use Python's flexibility, extend Python to allow precise and flexible control. Rather than detecting problems later, control them at the very start. Do not allow a value to be set to anything other than what you want it to be. And that only works if you can be precise and flexible. Now, obviously, C or C++ allows you to have um, full control. You can make sure that you only get the right thing in, but it's not flexible. You have it in terms of just primitive data types. You can't, it's very hard to do duct typing, very hard to do all these things that we do in, in Python. So um, the idea is that uh, instead of doing imperative code, where you tell the code, do x, test y, or even a lot of people will think that this is a declarative statement. I would argue that these assert statements here are imperative. They're saying, at this point in the code, check that this value is greater than zero, and if not, do something else. It's basically just a hidden if statement. It's very imperative in the way that people use it. Instead, don't, don't think about a data flow, or don't think about um, that you must tell the code to do something in a particular spot. Just think, okay, I. For this argument, I need an object of type Y with these parameters. And you can constrain the, the values of these parameters in ways that uh, don't involve uh, telling the code what to do. Now, and this might not make any sense, so um, let's maybe look at an example first. Um, here's the same code that I showed you. This is this plus this plus this uh, re-implemented using uh, something that's actually fairly similar to traits. Um, and all of that is implemented on one page here. It does exactly what the other ones do, other code does. The dot, dot, dot refers to things that are eliminated from the first one as well, um, just to make them fit on the screen. So what we do instead here, if something's going to be Boolean, we declare it to be Boolean, just as you might in some uh, uh, statically typed language. Um, if something is going to be of a certain type of object, you declare that, that you need an object of that type. If something's going to have a documentation string, you, you, you specify that when you cr first specify that um, parameter. Now, if you go back and look here, when these were first created at the abstract class level, there's no documentation. There's no meaning for any of this. It could be anything. So there's no constraint on what might happen at the lower levels, the uh, subclasses. But here, everything's defined exactly, as soon as you introduce it, you say exactly what it is. You say what, as much information as you have about it. In this case, we, just, we don't say any information about it, and that's because this particular thing uh, is, is a very polymorphic definition that's actually gonna cause people problems. But in any case, this mirrors the structure of that other code, but it allows you to very easily to specify what it is you're allowing. And then if you wanna write a subclass, you just need to add whatever the new parameters are. In this case, I added a, uh, another abstract class because this parameter is shared between the two subclasses. And then the implementation of this class, there is no implementation of this class. All it is is a one example of that um, type of connector. And the, the implementation of this class 
It just has one new parameter, and that's it. So all of the code here, everything that's duplicated is eliminated. Everything that's checked only partially is checked as, as much as you might want. And um, basically how that's done is that you can, if you have a suitable declarative programming package, you should be able to um, declare, not, not check, but just declare um, the, the range, the type, whatever it is that you want to, um, to enforce about your arguments. And it's going to always be true because it's, uh, this system and traits as well will not let you set it to something that doesn't, um, that it checks immediately when you try to set it and it stops you at that very point, right when you're doing it, and doesn't let it happen. And the uh, advantage of that is really that the rest of the code never needs to check anything again. If it's defined as Boolean, it's going to be Boolean. It will never have anything other than Boolean. So you never have to do another check. You never have to say, if Boolean this, if not Boolean raise error. You never do that. You never, you never raise an error. There never will be an error, except when someone sets it to the wrong value. And this uh, certainly re results in less duplication, and it encourages people to do documentation, whereas this approach strongly discourages you against documentation, because documentation is just going to have to be copied all over the place whenever you um, have a subclass. But in this case, the, as much documentation as you supply, that's how much you get. There's no problem with it. Um, and I talked about it in terms of a class. Um, where, so uh, here we can specify a particular class, but you can specify any constraint that you wish to, con to, uh, to use for duct typing. You can do it in base class, but you can do it by whatever constraint you want because you just imp implement a new type of parameter. Say there's a parameter type callable. It just checks that it has can be called. That's it. You have some other thing you want to check for a certain set of methods? No problem. So, and that's, that's the flexibility of Python. But it's the flexibility of Python to do exactly precise control. Only let things pass through that you actually know what to do with. So if you've written code and you can handle this, say exactly what you can handle. And then you don't have to worry about getting something you can't handle. It'll never happen. Uh, when you specify anything, you'll always get the type and the default value, the documentation, and the range. Those are all in one spot. They're going to match. They're right next to each other. You change one, you'll notice that it doesn't match. There's no text that says it's allowed to be a one unless it's a Tuesday. It, the text doesn't say that. It's, it's just right in the code there. And uh, of course, for free, you can get automatic help um, if you had it uh, on the command line. You can generate documentation and so on. But kind of the, the key is that these are still just Python attributes. Um, if you have an object that ha you just do, now you say x, you do x.delays, you get the value. It's not, the rest of your code doesn't care, except that the rest of the code doesn't need any of this checking and uh, reasoning about it. So here's a just slightly more complicated example. It illustrates, uh, let's say we provide this, um, this number type, a special type of parameter that accepts any type of number. And the main thing it does is it checks Python's number test. But one thing that it does is it allows uh, callables. So if you have a callable and you refer to this uh, parameter um, A in this case, that has been defined to be of type number, defaulting to 0.5. But if you set it to be not 0.5, but to be some callable, and you ask for A, you won't get 0.5, you'll get the result of evaluating that call, of calling that callable. So you get some number, you could do it again, you get a different number, you get a whole stream of things. If you think in terms of a scientific application, that will allow you to um, very precisely control variation and uh, parameter searches and so on uh, for your application in, very, in a way that the rest of the code doesn't need to know about it. The rest of the code doesn't know this is going to be a uniform random number, it just knows it's a number. That's all it needs to know. Um, but if, then you get, of course, if you try to set it to something that's not allowed, the bounds were 0 to 1, set it to 5, that's not allowed. You try to set it to 0.5, that's not allowed if it's a string. You do some help, you'll get both the things that were defined in this class, B in this case, but you'll also get everything inherited from every class above you. So anyone who does actually use traits will probably be wondering um, how this relates to traits. 
And in fact, it overlaps uh, quite significantly with what Straits offers. Um, this um, param has actually been in continuous use since uh, 2003. Um, originally dates from a 1998 version I did in C++. Um, but we've been doing it in this very specialized field of uh, computational neuroscience. So there are dedicated users, but not in the general field of science because it's been embedded in our, in our particular simulation package. And uh, when we noticed that traits appeared, this was 2005 or 2006, um, we noticed that. Um, we decided, oh, well, that's fine. We'll keep, um, we don't need to release param. There's no problem. Traits can have all the glory. Um, but we couldn't actually use traits, just as John Hunter mentioned, because we were using TK in our application, and traits didn't support it. So fine, we've, we've kept using it. It's, it works very well for us. Um, it consists of two Python files, so uh, doesn't, there's not a lot of maintenance issues. It's, it's all pure Python. It's really straightforward for us to maintain it. Um, and because of this, we've been getting requests recently, um, people who who find out about our software package, reject our software package, but they want this little bit of it. And uh, these are people who are aware of traits, but traits is a very ambitious project. It has um, a C implementation. It's got, it's, uh, there are a lot of files associated with it, and it's harder to embed it in a, um, into a small project. And so uh, bowing to pressure, we have uh, released um, a param for you to do with as you wish. Uh, basically, you can think of it as a lightweight uh, traits. Um, so um, you can also use it if you happen to need TK support, but I can't recommend people start TK projects at this point. Um, we've been using TK since uh, 2001, um, so we're stuck with it. But, um, but anyway, the whole point is um, a lot of people think that it's just for a GUI, traits and traits UI and so on, but actually it's Anything you write, if you're going to expose an interface to somebody, it, it is to your advantage to explicitly say what that interface is, so you don't have to worry about somebody not um, satisfying the needs of that. So uh, I won't go into our, there's a TK interface that's completely optional. It allows you to have things like slider bars and so on automatically. This doesn't take any code um, for that, out, that example. Anyway, so uh, in my opinion, everyone, uh, everyone who's developed a, developing a project beyond a certain size, beyond just a few classes, beyond just a few scripts even, um, you should use something like Param. You should use traits. If that, if that fits well in your, um, in your workflow, great. If it doesn't and you're worried, concerned about it, at least use something like Param because it's, it's minor modification to your um, programming style except for cutting out a lot of duplication a lot of things you didn't need anyway. So, and um, it's up on, uh, you can use pip, easy install, it's available to GitHub, anyone can have it, it's completely uh, BSD license, free for everybody. Well, the next speaker's uh, setting up, we can have a few questions over at the mic. I've, I'll start with a question. So one of the reasons I don't like using traits is often to, third party tools don't interact well with it. So when I have an init, I can actually see those params in the init string and things like that. Do you have any solutions to that problem with params? We don't, we haven't run into problems with uh, of, of the type you're talking about. Uh, maybe because we do it a slightly different way than, than traits. Um, at bottom, we just support attribute access and Anything can access that. It's not. So if you open Wingware, it doesn't understand that um, the fact that, because it, it'll have a semantic idea that here's your tr ID from your, your init, and it'll pull out that semantic information. So things like that, have you ever run into uh, You mean third party development tools? I thought you were talking about uh, things that you would integrate in your application. Um, OK, so no, we, uh, I don't use Wingware, so that, that hasn't been an issue. But uh, I could imagine that uh, any particular IDE you would use it's just using, it's Python, so if you have a smart enough IDE, it should work. Okay. But uh, that may be too much to ask of. Uh... Third question. Yes. The, uh, using this with Cython or a Cython version, is that ever possible? Or that uh, we do use Cython. Um, 
We tend to use Cython embedded deep inside an object and we use this at the exterior of the object. We haven't really even thought about combining the two, but I'm, I, I don't know. So, yeah, so that Cython would know the types too, if there's, if, you know, it's numbers and... Do you mean we could derive the types? Yeah, it's, we don't normally declare a type in a C-friendly way. Okay. We derive a user, what the user thinks of as a type. What can I supply? We could also derive a, we could specify things in a, in a C-type um, way that, that could be done. We haven't tried that. But that's a different type of, uh, for us, a, a notion of a type is something that the user cares about, not that the compiler cares about. All right, thank you.